Today is March 1st, 2017. You're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 40. We're covering this week's stories, including your racist AI, electrical brain stimulation from DARPA, and Alexa. Get out of my closet. So uh, get your Elon Musk boring company tunnels ready uh, and get on those super highways because Human Factors Cast starts right now. to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, happy Monday, Nick. How are you doing this week? I'm fabulous, man. I'm wonderful. This is this is a good week. This is a good week. I'm I'm in a good mood. Things are good. No, no uh, customer service issues or human factors issues that I have to bring up. Um, <laughs> Nothing better than a Monday starting off on a good foot, man. Yeah, man, it's a good Monday. How are you? I am good, dude. I, uh, I don't know. I've had a really good Monday myself as well. Good mood. Drinking some coffee out of my Star Wars mug. I'm ready to kick off Human Factors Cast. There you go, man. We got some good news. Um, for for. For both of us, I guess, but but we'll, that's a little tease. We'll get into it later. But uh, I want to bring this up. HFES 2017. It's in Austin. You going? Oh, man. Yeah, you know it. We're going to be down there hanging out at HFES. It'll be cool to be in Austin. I've never been, but always wanted to go. Yeah, Austin's one of those cities where I've, I have a, I have a couple friends who live down there, and, um, you know, I have I've, uh, plans to go for business, but, uh, yeah, it's one of those cities that, uh, anyway, we're going to be there. For eight, well, maybe, maybe. We're still working out all the details. One of us, for sure, will be there. I will be there, for sure. Blake is still a maybe, but we're working on it. Um, so, yes, if you are listening to the show and want to meet us at HFES, we will be there. Well, I will, for sure. But Blake probably will. Um, please, please, please come and say hello. If you see us at the gala, if you see us out and about, come up to us. Let us know that you listen to the show. Uh, we're going to try to get some swag to hand out. I don't know if that's kosher with H- with HFES, but stickers. I mean, come on. Uh, but yeah, come up and see us. We're also, in addition to that, we're going to try to do these daily recap shows like we did last year. Um, but instead of you know one show for the entire week, we're going to try to do it like Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday during the conference week. So that way, we can kind of do higher resolution kind of breakdown of what we saw. Um, because I mean, I I was I was by myself last time, and and Billy and Blake were asking me a bunch of questions, and it would be nice to kind of you know have multiple perspectives on the same thing. Yeah, but, it'll be awesome. Hopefully, if I can go too, because then we can talk about different tracks and maybe cover more of what's going on each day at the event. So it, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully, we can make it happen. Yeah, for sure. And we also have some other conferences potentially in the future that we're not quite ready to announce yet, but do stay tuned for that. We're always looking for different opportunities that you guys can interact with us. And also, we want to cover stuff that's relevant to you guys. So uh, so stay tuned for that. Blake, you got some stuff on here. What you been up to lately? Yeah, so I've been practicing a lot of front-end development, like really heavy with learning JavaScript, because that's something I'm a little bit weak in in comparison to like HTML and CSS. And I've used a lot of books to like teach me AngularJS and jQuery and all of them kind of lack the same thing where they don't really explain what the technology is used for or what a framework is, that kind of stuff. And I have a recommendation for the listeners. If you're into learning front end development, uh, it's a book called Big Nerd Ranch and it's just front end development. And the reason I recommend this one is it's like a crash course and not only the tools you need, but also a little bit of background. So how to use command line, what node, node JS is just small things like that. Uh, so that's a lot of what I've been doing. And actually, Nick, I have something to throw in here that's not in the notes. Uh-oh. Um, and Let's it's it. my best UX experience between of the week. So between last week and today, I'll, I've like logged a bunch of experiences I've had. And today, I have the best one ever. Let's so hear I was it. Looking, I was looking for a specific product, and I searched it on Google, and it happened to be a Target. It was like mixing bowls. When I clicked on the link to go to Target's website, it actually brought me up to the product page, but the product page focused on the store that was nearest me, how many of this item were in stock, whether I could get in the store, 
And then also the aisle it was in, the aisle that you could be found in in the store itself. Now, that's and pretty I went fantastic. there, took care of it. It was amazing. That's... Best UX goes out to Target this week. Hold on, hold on, hang on. Can you? What was the thing that you searched? I'm going to search it right now while we're on the show just because I want to see this. Actually, yeah, and it was pretty generic. I was just looking for some mixing bowls. I'm going to say Target mixing bowls. All right, shop at Target. So I got mixing bowl set room essentials. I clicked on the link, bringing me to Target here. And, uh, okay, so I'm not seeing where, oh, shoot, there it is. Yeah, that's the closest one to me, an ILB 47. Right? <laughs> Dang, that's cool. You know, it is a little uh, hidden shoot. there. I didn't see it immediately, but, yeah, it's on there, and that's that's pretty cool. Uh, this this episode of Human Factors Cast is not brought to you by Target, but still, that's pretty neat, man. Like, they, they deserve a shout-out for that. I, I I think that's great. Yeah, man, in all seriousness, for sure. But, Nick, what have you been up to this week? So I think I found out why I'm so happy on a Monday. It's because I had uh, I had nothing to do this weekend except for play games, and it was it was pretty nice. Um, so I, I I went back, and I started playing Horizon Zero Dawn again because uh, I beat the story, but I wanted to, like, really just... I wanted to get the platinum, and those of you who are trophy hunters know what that is. It's basically getting all the little achievements in the game. So... I just I I have to give them a shout out. I, their 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 interface is just fantastic. It's a fantastic feeling game because like I was talking with somebody uh, a couple nights ago about the controls of this game, right? And and the way that you hold a bow in this game. I want you to imagine like you're holding a bow right now. Now the first thing you would do is you bring up your left hand, right? So what do you do? You squeeze the left trigger. You pull up your left hand. You're holding onto the bow. And then to pull back, you pull the right uh, the right trigger, right? And it's almost like you're cocking back the bow. Now, if you let go of the left trigger, your bow goes down, right? And then if you let go of the right trigger, it fires. So it just feels so good. And then if you wanted to notch another arrow in it, you pull up the bow with your left trigger, and then you notch it with your right, uh, with your right um, bumper, and then you pull it back, and it just it feels so good. And the interface is just so well done, and it's especially nice after coming from... I just <laughs> just finished another game, uh, Mass Effect Andromeda, that just had... Uh, I, I wasn't too fond of the some of the design choices that went on there. Um, but it's just very refreshing coming back to something that feels so good. Uh, and then there's this other one that I just started this weekend, too. Persona 5, have you heard about this one? Okay, so when I saw this, I remember there was there used to be an anime called Persona. I don't know if Five was a part of it, but no, I don't think I've heard of this game. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm I'm totally unfamiliar with the series, but a couple of the gaming podcasts I follow covered this, and they have been nothing but positive about it. So I'm like, oh crap, I got to see what the fuss is about. So I picked this thing up, and um, you know, it basically follows this this high school kid, and it is anime style, so I wouldn't be surprised if it's a continuation. And I'm sure some of our listeners are like, "You idiot! It's it's this." But uh, and of course, I'm an idiot. I, I'm brand new to the series. But um, so so yeah, it's it basically follows this high school kid, and he has this fantastical life behind. Uh, like he basically ha- wakes up and finds this app on his cell phone that kind of transforms the world around him into like a shadow realm type of deal. Anyway it's such a weird balance because you're like in, in the real world, you are doing things like cleaning your bedroom and hanging out with friends and you have to pick and choose what you're doing. Like, do you build the relationships with your friends or do you clean your bedroom to make your, you know, studying more efficient or, and it manages to make these things fun. Right. And I got to thinking, I was like, (laughs) what can we do in our personal lives that, you know, can make the, like, cleaning fun, right? I don't know. I, That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, how does it make it fun in comparison to, I guess, like, being in the shadow realm? I don't know. I, I, this is one thing that I'm, like, really struggling with because I don't know. Like, I'm sitting here thinking, like, shoot, I, I got to, like, talk with some of my friends on Persona. Like, I, I don't know, like, what, what it is that makes it <laughs> – I don't – I'm – I will report back. Like, I literally am three hours into the thing, and it's like a 120-hour game. So I will report back with what exactly the essence of making fun is. All right, but we uh, – making fun is. Uh, but we got to move on because we got a ton of news. Um, I, I don't know if we had a ton. We got some news, though. We got to cover. Now, this is the part of the show all about Human Factors news. This could be anything from AI 
uh, VR, automation, medical, transportation, psychology, design, you name it. As long as it has to do with the field of human factors, it is fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? All right, our boy Elon Musk. So just what does Elon Musk's company, Boring Company, want to accomplish? Our clearest picture yet may be a video shown during Musk's TED Talk from Friday morning, which includes a rendering of a future underground transit network where cars travel on crisscrossing layers of tunnels that include sled shut sledge shuttling vehicles around on rails at around 135 miles per hour wow it's fast must vision includes parking spots that are actually elevator shaft entrances where drivers can pull in and descend to a network below once underground the car will travel along a sled merging with other tunnels and being integrated seamlessly into a network that includes other packets all controlled by computer for maximum efficiency. Now, I think they chose the wrong name for this company because this does not sound boring. Yeah, I, well, this is how you make the mundane fun. This is, have you seen this video, Blake? No, I haven't. I have not seen the video at all. This sounds really intense. Do yourself a favor, open up another tab, and let me hear you say wow when you look at this thing because this is freaking cool, man. Like, it basically... <laughs> It, uh, it it almost seems like an extension of his Hyperloop concept where you basically have these tunnels, right? And I don't know if, you know, they're going to suck all the air out of it so that way there's less uh, wind resistance. But I would imagine, you know, it's something that they could do. And the, being in a tunnel, there's less wind resistance. But um, the idea here is that, that uh, yeah, you basically pull into this parking spot. It pushes you down. It's an elevator. It pulls you down into the underbelly of the city. And then it transports you on this sled on a track um, to your destination at like a million miles per hour. <laughs> it's cool, man. What? Okay, this is crazy watching all these Teslas like go underground on what looks like basically an elevator like they describe. And then just zooming around in kind of an atmosphere that looks like the fifth element. This is nuts. Yeah, it's really neat. Uh, wow, yeah. I they wanna... did a really good job in the reproduction of that, but. So they're going to just do this underground. Very interesting, Mr. Musk. Yeah, so that's that's the plan. But I, I want to comment on something that's that's very cleverly designed. Uh, th so look at look at the way this thing, this elevator is going down. They clearly left the wall there. So that way you you can't go forward. You can't drive yourself off this thing. Right. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. And also, they, they put the wall on the right side, presumably because they want to hide oncoming traffic from you. Um, because on your left, you have uh, traffic that's going in the same direction. Although each of these is kind of like in their own self-contained little tunnel. I don't know how this will work. But uh, I, I just wanted to say, like, that's a good design choice where you can't see um, other things going on. And maybe it's just a cutaway. I don't know. The more I look at it, the more it seems like a cutaway. Yeah, I think you might be right, but I, I do agree with your point that not being able to drive forward is a plus. And even if if it is a cutaway, it's good that you're not like seeing a bunch of oncoming traffic because oh, yeah. I, I feel like this concept might be very, I don't know, nerve wracking to do like if you're actually in the car. Oh, yeah, for sure. And yeah, one thing that's not clear to me is that he has a couple of these stops like back to back. Um, and it's unclear to me whether or not. Uh, you know, they're both, you're, you're able to board both of them at the same time and then the carts will accelerate you. Anyway, we have many questions for you, Elon Musk. If you'd love to be on the show, let us know. All right, Blake, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. What's up next? So keeping it in the car world, so California's DMV will soon review the new set of proposed regulations that could change how autonomous vehicle testing works in the state. If the proposals are approved, we might see some truly unmanned autonomous vehicles with no steering wheels cruising California's streets. Apple, Tesla, and some other companies have that have permission to test their vehicles in the state want to see more changes to its policy, asking the DMV to require much clearer reporting of when human testers have to take control of the vehicle from the self-driving system to prevent accidents. Now, this is really in an interesting thing to see here. Because uh, now it's getting into the legislature and even down to the point of the DMV pro like having a new set of proposed regulations for these unmanned cars. Uh, but what do you think about this, Nick? 
Well, I'm really glad that companies like Apple and Tesla are jumping in and saying, look, we have to keep the human in the loop somehow. And you, you, state of California, you, are, are making it possible for us to do completely autonomous testing, and that's fine. But in the foreseeable future, there are still other components that are going to be interacting with the driver while they're on the road, and they need to be able to take control. They need to be aware of what's going on in, you know, in the case of automation, um, and they need to be able to take over when necessary. So it's really cool that these companies are basically saying, no, stop it. We need our drivers to basically pay attention to what's going on. Um, so I, I think it's great, uh, but I mean... I would still like to see the fully autonomous vehicles, and I don't think they're they're saying no to that. I think they're just saying for their specific vehicles that they they want the human the human in the loop, which makes perfect sense. Because I mean, it, at the start, I mean, we're not jumping into something like we just saw with Elon Musk that the car is on a track, so it can't it won't ever potentially have to have human intervention. But I mean, in this case, there doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to test unmanned vehicles without steering wheels, potentially without, I guess, people in them to intervene in case of accidents. Because I, I mean, for the foreseeable future, that's going to be the big testing factor is what do you do when you need to get back in the loop and understand what your car has been doing or anything like that? Right. And I imagine some of this, I, you know what? I imagine some of this has to do with, uh, the more I look at this, the more I'm convinced that some of this has to do with insurance because who's at fault if the automation fails? Yeah. Cause we, we've talked a little bit about that and it doesn't, it's definitely not on the company themselves or the, at least in the case of Tesla, we looked at, it wasn't on them. No, but, but that's because the human was able to interact. Now, if the human is completely taken out of this thing and the automation takes, con like, there's no way for the human to interact, right? It's a completely autonomous pod. Who's at fault? It's not the human because they are not controlling this thing. So I wonder, I wonder if these companies are doing this to basically say, look, if there are any accidents, it's not us because the human is supposed to be uh, aware of what's going on. I, I bet you that's what it is. Yeah, I mean that's a good point because if they're if if they're not going to allow like some kind of intervention between a human to the autonomous car, that would mean they would basically have to, if in order to get past this insurance problem, like people like Apple, Tesla would have to have almost kind of like UAV operators, but for cars, just right. in case something happened, watching the vehicle at all times. So I yeah. think your your point makes a lot of sense. Well, and then they would be at fault. So it's, it's yeah, yeah. So it, it's just a really bad recursive loop there. Yeah, I feel like it's an absolution of guilt and uh, responsibility. Uh, they're they're offering it as a service, and then, you know, if the human can't sort of interact with the automation at the level that is required, then it's on them. So that's kind of what I'm thinking that one is. Anyway, let's move on to the next story. What do we got? All right. So Google has made some adjustments to adjustments to how its search works, which is which is aimed at improving the general quality of return results and more specifically at fighting the problem of fake news. The changes are not only on the technical side of how search works, but also providing features that allow users to provide feedback when queries return offensive or misleading content. As well, Google has updated the search quality rater guidelines. And lastly, Google released a policy detailing how search works to help its community of users understand why sometimes a search can go wrong and return offensive content. Now, Nick, I find this one kind of strange because I never really realized how often people get like offensive or misleading content from their Google searches. And based on the article, it's, it's a small percentage. It's like, a, it's like, 0.25% of all queries, but with such a large user base, that is That's a big a number for Google. So I think this is, a, this is a good way to tackle it, but I'm not sure that it's going to solve the problems. Uh, yeah, see, I don't know if it'll solve the fake news problem, right? They're, they're, they're basically trying to solicit feedback on whether or not something is fake news, but if I disagree with something, I can say it's fake news. And you know, it, it might be real news. I don't know. Like, it, it, it's really sad that we're in an age of fact fighting and that it's hard to find facts and factual evidence of things. And um, 
you know, I, I don't know. I, I like that they're doing this because it's just one more data point. And I guess they wouldn't, you know, consider it fake news if just a one-off like me uh, said this is inaccurate. But if a large group of people, if I all said, you know, go search cats and said this is uh, offensive, you know, they'd be pretty confused about the outcome, <laughs> right? Yeah, and I think that's maybe where their search quality rater guidelines come in because, I mean, that's for the people that they have just constantly looking at content from the background to identify, like, what is this? Is this real? Is it, like, a an unconfirmed conspiracy? That's that true. kind of stuff. And I, and, I mean, I think it is good that people may have a, have a chance now to understand better how search works because uh, that may just make things more efficient for them. And it kind of gives Google an out for – like we're I'm seeing offensive content. Well, that's because this is how it works and you could have looked at this to avoid it. Um, so yeah, I'm just not convinced that it stops the fake news problem either. Yeah. Um, but I, the problem I guess I have with the fake news as well is if I feel like it instills people need better critical thinking skills when it comes to finding something they just like automatically want to believe in. Um, well, if it's on the internet, it's true. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest problem. It's the right cardinal now. rule. Everybody knows that, Blake. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, what do we... Well, actually, you know what? Before we move on, I just want to thank our friends over at TechCrunch and Gadget, Gizmodo, Science Daily, and Wired for all our stories today. You can always go over to all of our social media. Uh, we got a new one for you, too. We're on LinkedIn now as a company. Uh, look at us, big boys. Um, you can follow us all over there and find these links to the original articles over there. So, yeah, we want to thank them for bringing us these news stories this week. What do we got up next? This one's pretty interesting, Nick. So this one's all about an algorithm. <laughs> so algorithmic bias was big in the news this week, centered around a Moscow-based startup called FaceApp, who is apologizing for building a racist algorithm. FaceApp is a photo editing app that uses a neural network for editing selfies in a photorealistic way. The app lets users upload a photo of a face and offers a series of filters that can be applied to subtly or or radically alter its appearance with its appearance shifting effects, including changing somebody's age or even their gender. The problem is that the app included a so-called hotness filter, and this particular filter turned out to be a little bit racist. As users pointed out, the filter was lightening skin tones to achieve this mooded, beautifying effect. Whoa. So as if you check out their actual the actual article, it uses a picture of Barack Obama that surfaced that was illustrating this light skin light the skin lightening effects of this hotness filter. Now, Nick, this this turned out to be a pretty big deal for this startup. I'm interested to hear your thoughts about it. Well, I actually you know it's ageist too, because they remove wrinkles. Um, but <laughs> no, this is <laughs> I actually tried the app and I look good as an old dude, but um have you have you had a chance to try out this app? No, I didn't. I didn't even think of that for some reason. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at the picture now, and and uh, the evidence is quite clear. Um, Mr. Obama's skin tone is uh is quite more fair in after the post processing, and I'm I'm wondering, you know, we we talked about uh, was this last week or is this this week? I'm kind of losing it. Uh, the the whole uh, we we program. AIs to be racist because we are. Yeah, that was last week because of like the data you end up feeding it. Like uh, it basically regurgitates how actual people feel. I guess. Right, and I, I actually, I think the story happened right after our show last week. So it's kind of like one of those things where it's like, oh wow, when it rains, it pours, uh, and it's really unfortunate. It's like, why can't we define beauty by other things other than skin tone, and why, why aren't uh, computers able to detect these things. Um, I don't know. It, on on one hand, it's like the the internet is a treasure trove of data, but then it's also like, I don't know. It's just it's it's crappy what what kind of data is out there. I guess uh, I don't know. It's just this whole this whole story saddens me. So let me. I don't know. I kind of want to throw some two cents about this because I mean it, it. it's it's not great what happened but let's let's think about this in a logical way like for one this app is using a neural network in order to help edit selfie pictures which is pretty cool by rights now the problem is is they are using some of google's algorithms i think it's called tensor or something or another uh that helps them build this neural network 
But where the problem lies is that when they were feeding the app a database, it was very small, limited to something the startup company had itself. So, I mean, it's, and if you go based off of just demographics, right? So in Moscow, you might have a larger population of white people than anything else. It could be that the faces that they were using were all one specific type. So this building this hotness filter was based off of a very small data set, and it ended up not being translatable to worldwide use. Uh, so, I mean, I, I get that these guys kind of got shafted. I'm glad they apologized for it. But I, I don't think it's the end of the world either. I think they use too small of a data set, and this will hopefully allow them to now, because they've generated so much, so many views per day of using this app, that hopefully that'll allow them to expand uh, the data model they've been using and get away from anything like this. Oh, yeah, and you know they're collecting user data too, so hopefully, yeah, over time you'll see a change in that neural network. But it just goes to show you with uh, what what can happen when you have... Uh, a built-in bias with a data set like you know it alters this computer's perception of beauty and oh yeah it's uh, it's yeah. obviously going to be important for people to vet all the stuff they're feeding these like learning learning algorithms but i but again i think it's a big learning process for all these companies that are developing them yeah no for sure yeah get a get a representative sample i think is is the uh the moral of the story here all right, let's go ahead and move on to the next one. What do we got? For sure. All right, so a little bit more AI. So MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab has co- has figured out a way of measuring walking speed to within 95 and 99% accuracy, all without requiring a wearable or other on-body measurement device. Whoa. The tech uses wireless signals, dubbed Y-gate, by the, by the research team, sent out by router-like devices within the home to track walking speed and stride length over time. The ability to track walking speed over time is a huge boon to clinical research as it's a great indicator for helping predict health issues and better understand certain conditions like Parkinson's. Now, that is a really cool thing. To measure all of this, it can be used in a clinical setting without having to have a wearable on. Yeah, or in the home, too. Like, yeah, you can. Yeah. The the downside to this is obviously that it's not a, it's not a wearable, so you can't take it everywhere with you, but it's more accurate than a wearable. And um, it uses this by I, from what I'm gathering, it uses this from comparing signals of Wi-Fi and sort of the distortions within Wi-Fi. And it will then uh, sort of understand what your gate looks like. And then it interpolates that and produces a model. Which is just, that's that's so cool to me because they're using Wi-Fi signals and the bouncing of signals to basically echolocate your body. Yeah, it's epic. And I, I wonder how over time, what it, what of what things it can help predict. Like, because I'm, I'm pretty interested in how this is going to be linked to anything with Parkinson's. I guess maybe you could catch early signs if you start having like specific deviations or strange deviations from so, your normal gait. So check this out, Blake. So I'm in a hospital, and uh, I have this Y Y gate is hooked up in this room or whatever, and it's monitoring my thing. And you know, I'm I'm pretty sick. And over the next couple months, I start to develop Parkinson's. They have that data point now. Now they can extrapolate that model to someone else, and if they can start seeing uh, patterns, then they can, you know, they can then infer that that person may have Parkinson's, and it might be an early warning system to them all without being invasive, all without, you know, requiring them to interact with some device on them. I think this is really cool. Yeah, MIT just is really knocking it out of the park with some of the stuff coming out of their AI labs. They're wrecking it. All right, what do we got up next? All right, so this is by far one of my favorite stories of the week. So DARPA wants to rewire your brain to enhance human cognitive ability by activating what they refer to as synaptic plasticity in order to make you smarter. So research suggests that by stimulating nerves that relay signals between the brain, spinal cord, and the rest of the body, you can help people to learn better due to the release of neurochemicals that effectively reorganize your brain's connections. DARPA is currently funding eight separate research efforts in in the area of neuroplasticity with the end goal of translating their findings into real world applications, such as re- 
reducing military training times, and even development of consumer devices to enhance learning. Now, Nick, this they kind of like had a little bit of a scary twist to this, like saying they were going to use it for upping the time it took for military training, and there was an implication that it might create super soldiers. But I think this research is very interesting because if you can literally reorganize the brain with electric stimulation, I I can't even believe that that's possible. Well, it is DARPA, so, you know, What do you expect, right? Yeah, I mean, but they're they're always trying to make super soldiers in some way or another, but, but, um, so, so, Yes, right? Think about it. All learning is is forming new pathways. And if they can sort of tap into what pathways are being um, created when you are learning and where things are in your brain and kind of how they all talk to each other, then yes, this makes perfect sense. If you can create those connections through uh, through this um, brain stimulation therapy, then it makes total sense that you would be able to form those connections quicker and learn quicker because then those connections would be stronger. Uh, and yes, no, it's scary for sure. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I'm mixed about this because on one hand, this isn't exactly like the human brain interface thing that we talked about with Facebook the other day. So I'm, I'm really interested in the application. Like I would love to learn a new language if you know, brain stimulation just made it possible for me to forge stronger connections and my thoughts aren't necessarily being shared, but the ability to learn is being augmented. I'd be okay with that. And so when you start getting into my head that I have the problem. Oh yeah. And I definitely agree. I mean, it would be kind of crazy to be able to like go to a store and buy like a DARPA made product that would allow you to basically shock yourself or electrically stimulate your brain in order to rewire connections. The the one thought I do have about this is I know that they use a fair amount of transcranial st- stimulation to help with depression, but what's often found is it doesn't last very long. Uh, as far or there's diminishing returns in, right. in the amount of times that you do it. So I wonder how that would affect this kind of research or this kind of enhanced learning. Now again, this is looking at very specific types of nerves um so and they could be very different from what's used for like screening depression but there i wonder how overall the brain reacts to being reorganized does it find itself organizing reorganizing again back to you know baseline or does it stay like that in order to enhance learning over and over there there should be a lot of cool stuff to come out of this science oh yeah for sure darpa is always doing fun stuff uh and uh it'd be interesting to see what they do come up with yeah for sure All right, what do we got up next? All right, so this one's a little bit of fun with some robots. So a man decided this week that he'd stick it to RoboCop by allegedly punching an egg-shaped security robot who was patrolling a parking lot. He was arrested and charged with prowling and public intoxication, but the bot was not seriously damaged and was returned to its parking lot patrol duties. This bot can stream in 360-degree video and read 300 license plate per minute, and it's not likely to forget the face of the man that punched him. Now, looking at the picture of this, Nick, it looks like something out of Doctor Who almost. It looks like a Dalek, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, but I still can't imagine somebody just walking through a parking lot and punching a little robot. What was going through his head? Yes, you trying to pick a fight with me? You trying to fight with me? Come at me, bro. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) And then he he was all like like, exterminate. Like, yeah, I don't know it. This is one of those goofy stories that we just had to throw in because it it kind of um, sort of exemplifies the relationship that we're trying to develop with uh, robots and uh, artificial intelligence and all that stuff. And and just the fact that some people are so resistant to it that they want to punch it when they're drunk uh, still tells us that I think that we're not quite ready to uh, adopt this technology, although... I'm really, I'm really interested in what this actual robot does, right? It, it's a, it's a parking meter, uh, robot that will basically scan your license plate and know whether or not you are authorized to park in that parking lot. But yeah, I just thought this was one of those funny stories. We just had to throw it in, and uh, I forgot to mention the next web. Also, um, they, they also help us with that, with some of these stories. Um, all right, do you have any other thoughts on this guy? <laughs> I just thought it was one of those fun ones that we got to throw in there for a laugh every now and then. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's funny, but it does say something about how, like, 
it's important to understand social integration with robots because we're going to they're ultimately going to replace a lot of different kind of jobs. Like in this case, I guess somebody um, checking out meters for if you're able to park in a parking lot and how it's going to affect the way that we feel or perceive that robot. Like, is it do we treat it like a human or do we just have to remember that it's just a machine in wires with some programming behind it. So it'll, it'll be interesting to watch how that plays out and how we interact with robots more and more over the next like five and 10 years. You know, I'm curious. It's, it's egg shaped. I'm wondering if the interaction would have been different if it was human shaped and if it had fairy wings and a wand because it's a meter fairy. But I, I, <laughs> I do wonder how that interaction would have changed, right? Like if, if it was a human shape, would that drunk guy have hit it? Would he thought of it was a person? I don't know. It's yeah. I mean, would you take uh, would you take out your angst against something that looked kind of human versus something that just looks like a, an egg on wheels? See, there's there's research though that strongly suggests that you can feel empathy towards robots if if it's portrayed in the right way. So I don't know. Um, there's a whole uh, there's a robot out there, Pepper now that it, it's kind of like meant to be customized in retail settings, and um, it's humanoid. Uh, to better interact with people. So I don't know. It, it'd be interesting just to see how this changed if uh, if that happened. All right, let's move on to the next one, though, because I, I like For this sure. one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So a research group specializing in brain imaging discovered that changing tasks too frequently interferes with brain activity. Researchers had participants view films such as Star Wars and Indiana Jones in either 50-second or 6.5-second, 6.5-minute increments. They found that not only did participants' brain functions more smoothly when viewing longer, longer segments, but also that the brain areas that showed activation are important for turning individual elements into coherent events. According to this study, these areas of the brain work more efficiently when dealing with one task or one event at a time versus dealing with multiple tasks at once. And, you know, they make a, a lot of good points kind of towards the end of the article after talking about the study itself that the effect of social media that ha that social media has on our brain could be a little bit averse because you've got to think about so many different mediums, so many different stories from different people you know, trying to keep track of all of that in your mind and then jumping back and forth between all of it. I could see how it could kind of put your brain in just like a chaos state. Yeah, no, I... So I like this for a couple reasons. One, they use Star Wars and Indiana Jones and James Bond. You forgot to mention, but they also they also use uh, this. So I, I mentioned I think last week on the show or two weeks ago. I'm reading or I just finished today. Algorithms to live by, and uh, we've we've known this concept forever that there's there's a cost associated with switching tasks, and this is just more research that suggests that's true even when you're just perceiving things. Uh, versus, um, you know, you know, when you're just uh, uh, giving your attention to something rather than interacting with something. Like when you change modes at work from one project to another or um, from one thing to the next, you, you like to do those in longer spurts because then you get more done because uh, there's that cost associated with switching. And I guess it's true for, uh, for, for perceiving as well. So take yeah, that. Yeah, it's... <laughs> Take that For 20 sure. minute tweet TV shows. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes sense, but because like the longer increments of time help you to really like process what you're looking at and do some thinking and all of that. But there is something said for like pattern interruption between different tasks that kind of help you get in the mode of thinking some other way or being preparing yourself to tackle a new task. Uh, but I, I definitely agree with, what they're saying that it's it there is just like a giant cost or can be a cost to your brain by switching tasks and doing things in just short increments. Yeah, yeah. So uh what's up next? This one this one uh, I also like. <laughs> oh man. All right. So Alexa's back. So Amazon has introduced the Echo Look, an Alexa enabled camera that does everything Amazon's original voice assistant can do, plus judge your outfits to help you decide what to wear. It can catalog your clothes, suggest outfits, and help you choose one of two looks with its style check features. You can create you can create a style lookbook, which is of course, which of course allows the world's largest online retailer to recommend clothing that you might want to buy. And did you know that Amazon has its own clothing line? I think I smell a rhythmic 
algorithmic bias afoot. Now, Nick, this was freaking me out a little bit because now it's giving Alexa eyes because it's a it's like adding a camera feature. Yeah. <laughs> See, so what so, do you think about this? You have Alexa in I your do. home. You interact with her. I do. So I'm, I don't know. I'm like 50-50 on this because I like I want this for the style check feature, but then also that that means that I have to let Alexa into my bedroom, and by extension, I have to let Amazon into my bedroom. I don't know if that's something I want. If I did get this, it would definitely not be in the bedroom. Uh, it would be where Alexa is now, and presumably Alexa would move into my or my echo would move into my bedroom. Uh, but I want the style. I, w- I want to test out the style check thing, right? Cause this is intriguing to me. They, they had the app a couple weeks ago where you take a picture, you take a selfie and they rate your style and, and give you feedback. And I think that's cool. I like that. I, I like being stylish and I, I like the fact that it's kind of like a personal assistant that will help you dress and look good. Uh, and, Honestly, I I'm indoctrinated to Amazon. I will buy stuff on there all day because of Prime. They they have me locked in. Um, this episode of Human Factors Cast not brought to you by Amazon, but they got me, man. They got me by the balls. They got me by, with Prime. They got me locked in with everything, right? So if Amazon knows my body type and can suggest clothes based on that that look good on me and are fashionable, I'm in. Yeah, and I totally agree with you. I mean, I think I think this is a pretty cool feature. It is a little weird to like bring it into your closet, but the fact that it'll kind of catalog what you have and could suggest outfits to wear, I don't know. It takes away a little bit of having to make a lot of decisions in the morning. Uh, give you a little bit more mental power to start your day. Uh, but the one thing I do want to point out is, I mean, Amazon is trying to sell more stuff, of course, right? And they've got me hooked too. Like I love Prime. I love Amazon. I think I buy way too much stuff off of there and I'm sure that'll only increase over time. Um, But it's a, it's a cool feature. If it does freak me out to have kind of a camera that's taking images, analyzing you and then potentially storing it somewhere. Is it Um, always watching? Is it like Amazon, how it's always looking or always listening? Sorry. Is it always watching? <laughs> like I don't know, and I don't want to know. <laughs> that's the part that scares me, right? Like I feel like I would turn it away when I'm not looking for style tips. Um, but then also, like think about other things that you could do with this, right? Like uh, the, the, the applications are endless with a camera in your house that if you asked Amazon, like, I don't know, call my call my extended relative and uh you know use that as a video call and then if you have an amazon fire tv it just pops them up on the tv like i don't know there's there's a lot of things that they can do with their ecosystem now i feel that um would be good for just a a wireless uh smart home thing but yeah man cameras i I don't know i'm out i'm out like i'm gonna try it for sure but i probably turn it around when i'm not using it honestly well, you you make a good point, Nick. I mean, this is kind of a foot in the door of having the camera in there, and it seems to be targeting like people that are stylish or want to like have wear be wearing good clothes and For stuff now. like that. But I'm sure you're right; they're gonna roll out more probably features that have to do with the camera and give you more interactions to have. And it probably, uh, if I was to guess, I feel like there's gonna be some kind of social aspect to all of this at some point. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, why wouldn't you? Because really, if you can get your friends to to buy into something, that's that's how you get uh, people on board. Hundred percent interesting, interesting stuff. I can't wait to hear about it. Yeah, let's go ahead and talk about uh, what not to do. For uh... <laughs> oh man, this is this is kind of a bummer. So operating system updates are good for security, but Microsoft Windows has had an insidious way of suddenly deciding it's time to install that latest patch and restart your computer right in the middle of when you're working on something, like putting together Human Factors cast notes. So Microsoft's recent update to roll out a bunch of features, and one of those was to allow users to finally push back automatic updates for a limited time period, so to give you time to finish out whatever task you were doing. However, there's just one problem. By not installing updates automatically, this makes Microsoft's operating system very unstable. And 
manual installation actually requires you to have some advanced knowledge of how to use your computer. So Microsoft is recommending to allow automatic updates for the time being until it can resolve its sta stability issues. Now, this was a scary one for me to read, Nick, because I recently just got a new laptop that has Windows 10 on it, and I was trying to remember if I had <laughs> told it not to update recently while I was streaming. Oh, shit. You know what? My, my partner's computer just bricked, and I'm wondering if it's because of this very reason. Ooh, that is a good point. Like, this know. just happened. I don't know. I, I'm really curious now. I'm going to go investigate. But uh, what the hell, Microsoft? What are you doing over there? With Like, uh, this shouldn't have made it past it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, the, <laughs> the problem is, is like we talked about, I think, last week. The I mean, the features they're rolling out with this update, they weren't anything like show-stopping or major. It was like a, a few a few creative tools and that was right. kind of it. And for the update feature, which is probably the most valuable thing that you can push the update for a little while, <laughs> right. being causing you to have like an unstable operating system. Come on, man. Yeah. I like, this is my favorite feature of this entire thing and I can't even turn it on yet. Um, in fact, just before we went on tonight, I had to restart my computer. Like because of the update thing, I, I haven't turned it off because I saw this story earlier this week and was like, Nope. <laughs> Smart move on your part, man. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You any other closing thoughts on this one? No, I think I'm good. I just hope they get their stability issues together. But, yeah, that's kind of it. I hope so, too. Yeah, that's going to be it for today, everyone. If you have any suggestions for topics or news stories that we missed, you want us to cover or whatever, you can follow us all over social media. Like I said, we are now on LinkedIn. Please go follow us. It's a great way to keep in touch professionally with all the stories we post here. You can also head on over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook page, comment on our SoundCloud, reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter, uh, or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. You can always leave us a voicemail. The voicemail line, 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. If you like what we're doing, uh, and you know because we bring these things to you ad-free except for Amazon, and uh, Microsoft and everybody else. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. Uh, if you really like what we're doing and don't want to give us money, you can do this, and it would really help us out. Go and review us and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. We love getting those reviews, uh, and uh, we always read them. Just make them good. Make them good. It helps us out. Helps you out keeping your favorite show on the air. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnstorff for joining me today. Blake, where can they find you? Those listeners. You where, guys <laughs> Where can they find you? Guys you guys can always find me at Don't Panic UX on Twitter. And if you see a great user experience or have one this week, tweet me. Let me know. Maybe we'll feature on the show. Yes, please do. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next week. It depends. Oh, uh -huh. it does depend, it sir. It depends on license agreements and updates and other depends stuff. Depends on if you use a large search criteria. Search fake news. <laughs> <laughs>